Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everybody. My name is Lorna, and I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) And uh, before I go much further, I'd like to... uh, get the, my manners part out of the way first. I often forget this, and I want to thank so much the committee for inviting me to speak. I know you have a choice of many speakers, and it's not lost on me what a great privilege it is to be asked to speak. And um, So thank Roman especially, and I understand that Keith is responsible for me uh, being here, and Larry, and all the people that... Uh, I've met here, and as a special thanks to Nancy, who, um, you know, I came off the plane yesterday, and I certainly wasn't the only one on the plane. It wasn't a private flight or anything. And uh, she spotted me the instant I came off. And I had a hat on. I don't know how she knew it was me. So, uh, and we've had a wonderful time. She's taken me around, and we went horseback riding this morning. And... um, I even got Nancy to come with me, so we've had a a terrific, terrific time, and uh, I'm delighted to be here in Alabama. And now you're probably, by this time, a little confused, because on your program it says, Lorna Kelly from New York, and um, you're thinking to yourself, that doesn't sound like a New York accent. (laughs) Um, I'm tempted to say it's a West Texas accent, but... uh, (laughs) I think you can tell the difference. Anyway, um, I think the best thing to do is to be very classic about this and to share my experience, my strength, and my hope. And um, I think, actually, the theme of my drinking can be conveyed in the terms I always missed out. I was always missing out. I was never, you know, a day late and a dollar short. I went into mini skirts the years maxes came out. I was always <laughs> kind of wrong. You know how alcoholics are always whining and say, I never felt like I fit in. Well, we don't. And, <laughs> <laughs> and when I was a young girl growing up in England, just before I came here, um, I, on Sunday nights, I used to go to this jazz club in Richmond, uh, near the Thames, which was very close to where I lived, and there was this uh, rock and roll group that played there on Sunday nights at the Station Hotel, and the leader of this group was rather sweet on me. He, he fancied me, and I really didn't want much to do with him, and um, the name of that group was the Rolling Stones. So... Um, You know, I might not have liked him, but it would have been a wonderful thing to have on my resume, don't you agree? (laughs) So, uh, now I really, he probably doesn't know me from a hole in the wall, but I certainly know him. Um, And at the the very, you know, I often describe the end of my drinking, it was no great uh, um, uh, thunderous bottom. I often describe it, I, I was like a plane coming into land without my landing gear. Um, and I belly flopped along the runway for a long time and all my undercarriage was scraped and torn apart and you know the the wings were ripped off and the fuselage was in pieces and the passengers were strewn over the runway and there was luggage and underwear hanging on the bushes and (laughs) it just looked like that it was just the end of my drinking was mucky and sordid, and messy, and tawdry, and I have a real woman's story. Um, And at the, uh, I came in in the August of 1976, and in the July, I was in London uh, for my business. I had a very prestigious job. I'm the first woman art auctioneer in America, and I worked for a very um, big company, uh, art auction house, and I was in London 
Um, and we were having this very fancy dinner dance at some swank hotel in London. And I was all done up like a dog's dinner. And there was Lord and Lady Duwa Diddy there and people that owned great collections and heads of museums and things like that. And while everyone was dancing, I was going from table to table emptying their wine glass into mine. And something struck me, something said, you know, my behavior does not quite go with my outfit. And um, I couldn't get what was wrong. I couldn't quite get, and you know, the alcoholic thing of, oh, they wouldn't understand, and that's just the way I am, and it's me after all. And those are, uh, you know, the biggest loser phrases that I think the alcoholic, especially in recovery, can have. And those are, that's just the way I am. And that's the way I always do things. And that's the way it is. And um, anyway, uh, I was, I was just in the, I, I um, was going out with this fellow. And, um, you know, at the end of our drinking, we're rarely going out with the cream of the crop. And um, <laughs> he was in Paris, and I went from London to Paris to be with him. It sounds very glamorous, but believe me, it wasn't. It might as well have been going from New Jersey to Hoboken or something. I mean, it was not glamorous. And... Um, I uh, I came back from Paris because it, it had just been very tawdry there with him, and I was with my parents, and I wanted to come back to New York because it was 1976, and it was the year of the bicentennial, and I wanted to see those tall ships. I, I forgot to say I live in New York now. I wanted to see those tall ships going up the Hudson River. And I wanted to be in America. I wanted to be in my home in New York celebrating uh, America's bicentennial. And I came, when I, I left my parents' home, I was feeling so dreadful and so wrapped up in myself, self, self. I couldn't, you know, my father was standing at the garden gate waving goodbye to me as I went off to London Airport. And I was so wrapped up in my sad life for my, you know, terrible love affair, my unrequited love and this and woe is me and isn't it dreadful. I just couldn't be bothered with my father. And it was like, yes, yes, bye. And it was the last time I was to see him. He died very suddenly. And um, that memory fills me with regret. I, um, you know, it said to us in our program that we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. I regret that. I regret not having the time with my father. I regret that missed opportunity, which I will not have again. And, but that memory spurs me into not being casual about my partings from people. I might never know when I will see them again. Not to be doing something else as I'm saying goodbye to someone. And you know, in this day and age, we're so full of multitasking. And I live in New York, and a lot of the sad stories were about 9-11, that people just weren't there to receive that last phone call, or just couldn't say goodbye, or the frustration of not having said goodbye to their loved one when they left the house that morning. So, um, uh, so that's another thing of just missing out. I just missed this whole thing with my father. And I came back to New York, and I live on Manhattan Island. I live on a piece of land that's surrounded with water. And I didn't know how to get to the river. I didn't realize that I could have turned left or right and kept walking, and eventually I would have hit water. You know, it was all too much for me. My life was just becoming too much, too overwhelming. How do you find the river? How do you see those tall ships? How do you get to do it? I mean, the information was legion about this party going on in America, and the whole of America was celebrating and I missed it. I just stayed by myself, isolated, and drank. 
And, you know, I'm 30 years sober, and I think it's only in the last, mm, I'd say, four years that I'm really getting in touch with the depth of my isolation. The depth, I mean, I had a very public job. I was surrounded with a lot of people. I was 30 years old. Why didn't I have a lot of people to go to this celebration with? Why hadn't I made a break? Why didn't I have a whole load of girlfriends or that people to go with? I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, so I missed the bicentennial and here I was belly flopping along the runway to my bottom and, um, a little while later, this fellow that I was going out with uh, came back from Paris. He lived in New York also, and I went. I we were going to have brunch one Sunday, and um, I got up that Sunday morning, and I fixed myself a jug of vodka and orange juice, and I poured myself a tumbler full. And as I was drinking this concoction, I took a look at the glass, and I said to myself, good God, I'm drinking in the morning. This is a morning drink. Now, there's an ancient Chinese saying, I always say, you know, have you ever heard of a modern Chinese saying? They're all ancient, but anyway. Um, <laughs> that says... The beginning of wisdom is to call something by its correct name. Now, I'd had a drink in the morning many, many times before, but I'd called it brunch, I'd called it a gallery opening, I'd called it summertime, I'd called it Wednesday, or something. Um, I lived in Spain for a short while, I had um, cognac in my coffee every morning and I called that being continental I mean I never called it drinking in the morning this particular morning health came running along and, and I identified it I said this is a morning drink and then the disease whispered in my ear and the disease said oh Orna, the sort of woman you are the kind of job you have to hold down, the mind of you, just the you of being you. <laughs> why, why do you make life so difficult for yourself? Why don't you do this every morning? <laughs> it, it would be so helpful for going to work and just to have, you're not like everyone else, just to have this little extra... Mm. Um, you don't want to be drunk or sloppy or anything like that, just a little lining of courage in your stomach in the morning. And with that thought, I could not release the glass from my hand. I physically could not put it down. And I got in the shower, and I remember trying to soak myself, <laughs> keeping this precious liquid out of the shower. And um, anyway, I went off to lunch with the brunch with this chap. And um, just as a, a, a story about him, I, I wanted to marry this fellow. Um, the fact that he hadn't asked me or even mentioned it just didn't seem to pose any kind of a problem to me. Um, and the fact that I wanted to marry him, why I wanted to marry him, was actually that he had the one thing in the world I wanted. And that wasn't a kind heart, or great love for me, or wonderful manners, or gentlemanly behavior, or any of those things that I consider important. Mm -mm -mm. He had a maid. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was desperate for the maid, you know. I wanted someone to run my bath, I wanted someone to lay my clothes out, I wanted someone to say, it's time to eat, it's time to go to bed, I wanted someone to brush my hair, I just wanted someone to do my life for me, because it was all too much for me, it was becoming too overwhelming for me to manage this life, and um, <clears throat> every house you sat, every chair you sat in in his apartment had a little container next to it of loose cigarettes, an ashtray, and a lighter that worked. And I was always looking for one or all three of those things. <laughs> and I always say, you know, I allowed this fellow 
to touch the sacred temple in order to get to the maid. And um, <laughs> in some circles, that's called prostitution. <laughs> But hey, what the hell, you know, um, um, what, does I, what did I care as a woman about the sacredness of my body or the mystical thing of an of a intimate act with another human being? It was sort of, you know, coffee, bagels and intercourse. I mean, it was all sort of <laughs> on the same level. It had no gradation about it at all. Um, Anyway, um, I went off for brunch with this fellow, and it was a disaster. I drank more. I ended up on the steps of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, I, it was a summer afternoon in August of 76, and all of life was going on around me. I could see all of life. And I knew it. There were couples and people going in the museum and out, and it was a typical New York Sunday afternoon. And... I somehow, I know alcoholics often describe it this way, that I could see life, it was somehow a remembered vision, and I couldn't get to it. I knew that there was some huge plastic wall between me and what I was seeing, that I could see it, yes, but I wasn't a part of it. And I'd never felt so screamingly alone as I felt at that time. I mean, it really came through. I think I'd always circumvented that loneliness with drugs and alcohol or other substances and um, I but it came through very clearly and I stood up and I didn't know what to do with myself and a voice came to me and said go to one of those AA meetings now I want to backtrack here and say that you know I was crazy about this chap but I had been married and my husband <coughs> had walked out, had left the marriage, and actually he'd walked out the door, and I thought it was the most fascinating thing he'd ever done. I mean, it really caught my attention that this guy left. And I was desperately unhappy and wanted him back, and very miserable at uh, my, the breakup of my marriage. And um, anyway, I was sitting in a sauna one evening, stark naked with a girlfriend of mine, and she said to me, you know, Lorna, last night I went to a meeting called Al-Anon, and all the women sounded just like you. And as soon as she started talking about alcohol and alcoholism, it triggered something in me. And I thought, oh my God, that's it. Anyway, the very next night I found myself in a meeting of Al-Anon. And it was suggested at that meeting that if one wanted to learn more about alcoholism, one should go to open AA meetings. So, the next night after that, I had checked it out. I, w I was to do something that I had done, that I did quite for quite some weeks and a few months, actually. I, right opposite where uh, Sotheby's was, where I worked, was uh, the Carlisle Hotel. And they had a bar in there called Bemelman's Bar. And I went into Bemelman's bar after work with my friends because I loved drinking on an empty stomach. I loved to fast all day and have that first vodka hit my stomach. I don't want to fiddle around with the peanuts and the chatting and the this or that. <laughs> Just give me that. And so I'm in the bar drinking on this Thursday evening and I said to my friends, ooh, it's almost 7.30. I'm going to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I'll be back. And, um, <clears throat> so I toddled up the road to this meeting called Lennox Hill. And Lennox Hill in those days was really sort of the blue blood, silk stocking meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. There were all the lawyers and the Park Avenue dames and all that were there. And I checked it out beforehand to make sure that people like me, who were not alcoholic, could go to this meeting. <laughs> so um, I waltz in, and I, I sit down, and some chap gets up on the stage, much like I am now. But I remember, I always remember this, you know, in front of the podium where he stood was one of those signs in the, you know, typical AA Gothic print, and it said, but for the grace of God. So I suppose you were supposed to look at this poor wretch standing up here, and you were supposed to see that, but for the grace of God, you could be just like him. And, um, and 
and uh, anyway, he stood there and he said, you know, my name's Don and I'm an alcoholic. And in those days we didn't say, hi, Don, or anything. Anyway, he, and I remember thinking to myself, well, good God, we don't all want to know. I mean, <laughs> surely there's some things you keep to yourself. I mean, really. <clears throat> But anyway, Don went on to tell this very interesting story, and after Don had finished, two other fellows got up and told equally as interesting stories, and I'm laughing and carrying on, and I'm slapping my knee, and I'm feeling, you know, I didn't understand that I was identifying incredibly. Excuse me, I don't know why I'm like this. <clears throat> and um, I think I could actually stop there, because I think that that's what qualifies one as an alcoholic. I think... If you like coming to these meetings and listening to how, you know, people contemplated suicide, attempted murder, um, <laughs> woke up in bed with strange people in strange places, vomited on their bosses and their clients, and were crawling on the bathroom floor and hugging the toilet, and you find that interesting. There's something the matter with you. Um, <laughs> And not only do I find it interesting, it's 30 years later, and I still find it interesting. <laughs> and I like to go to coffee shops afterwards and talk about it, and I like to get on the phone and talk about it. It's endlessly fascinating. People's drinking stories. I mean, real, you know, regular people are not, they're like, that's quite enough of that. I don't, that's more than I need to know. Um, so, uh, after the meeting, I went back to Bemelman's bar, and of course, I, what did I know about anonymity? I didn't, and I thought it was a jolly good job that you were anonymous, so you should be, after all. Um, <laughs> but I didn't know anything about it, and I told my friends at the bar, I said, oh, you'd never guess who is an alcoholic. <laughs> and I told them all sorts of details about their lives and all that, and... Um, Anyway, after that meeting, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, I knew that my husband was an alcoholic. <laughs> I just knew. So I thought, you know, I'll keep going to these meetings and I'll learn how to get him back. So I was familiar. I had gone to AA meetings. I'd gone to quite a few. And I walked in and you saw me coming. You know how you are. And I just sat there and I said, I'm here for my husband, actually. And you were very kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, but this particular Sunday afternoon when I was on the steps of the Metropolitan, I stood up and I thought, I'm going to go to one of those meetings. And I went into a meeting uh, downtown at the Moravian Church at 31st Street and Lexington Avenue and there was a woman speaking and she was to me at, it was God in the form of what looked to me like a hag I mean I was I was 30 years old she was probably younger than I am now and um, she had she, she was sort of my build actually and she I always remember she had broken capillaries all on her face and she told my story up to where I was at that very moment. And then she went on for another 15 years. And I got to see coming attractions. I got to see it. It was a grace. Because you know when you're young, when you're 20, and people talk to you about being 40, it's like, way out there, way, you're never going to be 40, you know, <clears throat> and especially not 50 and 60, you're, by, you know, you're buying your little plot for them to lay you in, I mean, <laughs> and so you can't see but when you're that age, but I was given the grace to see coming attractions, and I knew there was no difference between that woman and myself except moment by moment by moment by moment and you know you're 20 and boom you're 30 and boom 40 and boom 50 and I knew it was going to come very quickly and I was extremely healthy and so the body probably wouldn't have died for quite a while but I was got, my life would have just been a continuation of that Sunday and I knew it 
And the and I said to myself over and over again in that meeting, Oh my God, I drink. I drink. It's drinking. It's not the husband or the lover or the job or the country or my parents or my weight or any the fact that I smoke. It's nothing. I drink. And this awareness, this awakening was so bright and so um, savage almost that I ran out to that meeting and I ran into the nearest bar and I knocked back a few more uh, vodkas and orange juices. It was just too much. And that night... (laughs) That night I went out and, you know, typical, I went out and drank all night and... um, I, somehow I got home and the next day I woke up and that evening I walked into a meeting and uh, I said I'm here for myself. And just because I'd had that great awakening didn't mean to say I had all sorts of information at the beginning. I had absolutely no information whatsoever. The curtains closed again and yes, I was on the other side, but totally at sea. And ten days after that um, uh, event, I was in Washington on business and um, uh, after the business we were having a a dinner at a a client's house and it was a fairly casual dinner. There maybe were eight of us at the table and there were goblets uh, at each setting and wine was poured. And I didn't know enough to say no thank you. I didn't know enough to put my hand over it. I didn't know enough to turn the glass over. I didn't know enough to say, could you please remove this from me? I just didn't know those tools. I thought that Alcoholics Anonymous was all about learning how to resist alcohol. I thought I was here to learn to be cool around alcohol. No, it doesn't bother me if you're drinking. Go right ahead. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, I'm like a pimp around alcohol, you know. If you're drinking, I'm like, how come you haven't finished that? Don't you want another one? Um, I'm just so intrigued. But, but anyway, I, I didn't understand the the mystical thing of surrender I just thought it was all about resisting I thought I should have a platonic relationship with alcohol and I'd like to segue here to something I was reminded of this evening that I often say in my story but I haven't said for a while that um, when I came into the program I was told to get all the alcohol out of my house and of course me um, I um, and when I was about mm, 10 months sober, I think, the, I did what I was told. When I was 10 months sober, um, I had an accident in my home. I opened an ironing board and there was a loose piece of metal and it went right through my thumbnail. And the whole program, my computer of AA, just went, chung, crashed. There was no AA, there was no steps, there were no meetings, there was no sponsor, there was no friends, there was no nothing. It crashed. And I went to the cabinet to get out the bottle, and it wasn't there. And, you know, I was able to (gasps) reboot uh, the computer and (laughs) put up, you know, the blood was going... (laughs) I wasn't taking any notice of the injury. I was going for the bottle. And I was finally able to put a a Band-Aid on it and and realize, you know, thank God that it wasn't there. And it is said... Um, that any alcoholic who has alcohol in the house, no matter for what reason they say it's there, and I'd like to repeat that, no matter for what reason they say it's there, my spouse drinks, my children drink, I want to be able to offer it to friends when they come by, no matter for what reason they say it's there, it's got their name on it. And, you know, I was told that Orthodox Jews do not keep ham and Swiss cheese in the refrigerator. (laughs) And people that don't smoke do not keep cartons of cigarettes in their house for their friends who smoke. And Muslims don't have a side of pork in the deep freeze. And 
I don't know about you, but I've yet to go to someone's house and they have little piles of cocaine and heroin <laughs> on the table and um, they have, you know, the works and, and, um, and the syringes and they say, well, we don't shoot up, but maybe you'd like to. <laughs> so... This thing of keeping alcohol in the house and keeping it around and serving it and being casual and feeling, oh, it's Christmas or people are coming over and I really should, it's not, a, if that is what I'm doing, I have not taken the first step on a radical level. I have not taken it on a radical level. I've said, oh, well, I'm powerless over, it's all right for this, there's just this bottle in the fridge and I certainly wouldn't touch it because I never drink at home. But, you know, anything any alcoholic has ever done under the influence of alcohol, I'm capable of doing. And one of the things I have to really be cautious of in my own story is to say, not to say, oh, I would never do that. Or, I'm not that sort of an alcoholic. Or, no, 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 that, that, you know, I'd never molest a child. That's not my sort of thing. I wouldn't do that. And um, I'd never murder. I'd never do that. It's not my style. I'd never drink in a bar or strip or whatever we get up to. And, um, uh, but if an alcoholic has done it and I have alcoholism, I will do it. I can't say I would never do it. I am not a sort of alcoholic. I don't have my brand of alcoholism. And one of the things that I've had to try and really pay attention to in my lingo is not talk about my disease, like this friendly little, oh, my disease, like Fred or something, you know, this little thing that's my disease. Because if I talk about my disease, eventually I'll start talking about my program. And I will, you know, if left to my own devices, I'll have this designer type of program. And I can't have my program. I have to have the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it all must apply to me. And anything any alcoholic has ever done, I'm capable of doing. And anything alcohol, any person who has stayed sober has done, I must be open to doing also. I cannot skip the beats. Because if you're an alcoholic of my soul, <laughs> One of the things, the main things that keeps me in AA, you know, I always say I'm deeply shallow. And <clears throat> one of the main things that keeps me in AA is not great love of you or love of God or always gratitude. It's greed. I know that this is where it's happening. And I don't want you getting something I'm not getting. So... <clears throat> Anyway, so here I am, I'm in Al Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, my time is really racing on, but I, um, you know, when I first used to speak, I used to think and I used to say, I hope, um, I used to think to myself, good God, the next time I speak, I must get my story straight. <laughs> and there's no getting it straight, because I see it differently all the time. And I used to think and I used to say, you know, God, I hope there's something I can share that's helpful to you this evening. And I know that I, I'm not here to help you. It would be very arrogant of me to think that I was here to somehow impart some wisdom to you. It's not that way at all. I'm here because God thinks I need an awful lot of help. And I get to have myself to tell my story and have myself reflected back uh, from you. But anyway, I come into AA... And, and my thinking was all, you know, all over the place. And one, one of my thoughts was that you took one look at me and you nudged each other and you said among yourselves, oh, thank God Lorna has arrived because now we can hold our heads up high because Lorna adds great tone and class to AA. <laughs> and she will lead us out of the darkness of anonymity into the light of publicity, and Lorna is among us. And um, 
you know, meanwhile, what you were doing, you know how you are, you were patting me on the back and you were saying, you keep coming back, sweetheart, you're in the right place. And I didn't know how you knew I was new. And um, <laughs> the fact that I'd been wearing the same dress for the past three months and... Um, the fact I, 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 I had other outfits. I did have another dress I could have worn, but I just couldn't be bothered to put it all together. I just couldn't be bothered to think of another outfit. It was just too much. And I came in, I had masses of jewelry on all over the place. I just was loaded down with jewelry. And I had gobs and gobs of makeup on. And, um, you know, I was like Elizabeth I. I couldn't be bothered to take it off every night. I just slathered more on every day. <coughs> and, uh, you know, I wondered how you knew I was new. I just thought... Oh. And um, my, I got a sponsor, and she was really... You know, we always get the perfect sponsor, and she knew she couldn't talk to me about drinking. She knew she could, I couldn't grasp the fact that I drank. Because for the longest time, I thought I had nipped it in the bud. I thought, oh, aren't I smart? That I've come into Alcoholics Anonymous before I have a really serious problem. I, I mean, I haven't done this, and I haven't done that, and I, I had never woken up in bed with a strange person. I was sort of looking forward to that, but anyway, I hadn't done that. <coughs> I, I, um, I was never blessed with a blackout. I just, uh, you know, it was... Um, there were lots of things I hadn't done, and I thought I'd nipped it in the bud. I thought I was sort of lightly dusted with alcoholism. I was the sort that if I didn't watch it, I could develop a bad case of it. But I didn't really have it in a very serious way. And, um, and then, on the other hand, you know, I thought that you were going to say to me, at what, meanwhile, you know, one, on one hand you thought it was so wonderful that I was among you, and on the other hand I thought that some of you were going to come to me and say, excuse me, sweetheart, I mean, exactly how much have you drunk? I mean, really, what the devil are you doing here? And we, know, we notice you always sit in the front row and you eat an awful lot of cookies and do you mind? You know, <laughs> come back when you've got a story to tell. And, <laughs> But you didn't say that at all. You didn't say that at all. You were saying things to my sponsor like, God, I hope she makes it. Um, <laughs> do you think she'll be all right? And um, my sponsor said this one amazing thing to me that kept me coming, kept me hooked in. She said to me, you know, Lorna, if you stay with us and do what we suggest, you will, be, you will be able to develop a life that will be like having a quiver of golden arrows on your back. And when you come into a situation in life that you're not too sure how to handle, you'll be able to reach back, select the perfect arrow, put it in your bow, and hit bullseye every time. And that idea of hitting bullseye every time was so intoxicating to me. I was always wrong. I was a jagged scream. You know, as I said in the beginning of this story, alcoholics are always whining that they never fit in. We don't. We don't fit in. We're always this wrong thing in society. And um, I just... The, 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 the invitation to be appropriate was so wonderful to be able to dress appropriately, to laugh appropriately, to speak appropriately, to just have good manners. Just all that stuff I had to relearn. And I'd been brought up correctly. I had this very big job. I had all the... But something about me was wrong. Just wrong. And uh, I didn't lose my job. But, you know, when you're sober a while, you can see where your life was going. And I know that my boss would have called me into his office and he would have said to me, you know, Lorna, you do a great job for us and you make a lot of money for the company, but you're a loose cannon and we just don't know what you're going to do next, what you're going to say next, how you're going to come to work dressed next, and we can't afford it. You know, every 
job has its uniform. If you're a policeman, you wear a policeman's uniform. If you're tossing pizza, you wear that uniform. If you're digging ditches, you wear that uniform. If you're a bank manager, every job has... My job had a uniform. I'm selling millions of dollars worth of art a year, and it had a certain uniform. And I was coming in, you know, with green and black nail polish on with, you know, mini skirts that were like skating skirts. I mean, it was just... I was just... I had great legs, but still, it was... <laughs> I wasn't the work of art, you know, um, so I was just uh, very wrong. I often say that I'm very grateful that I came into AA before the trend of tattooing and piercing came out, because I'm sure I would have had the last supper put on my chest, or, um, you know, or the whole crucifixion scene with blood dripping down or something like that, and... Um, and I, you know, I wouldn't have been satisfied with a dainty little thing in the side of my nose. I probably would have had a plate in my lower lip, you know. <laughs> so, God save me. But anyway, um, here I am in AA, and I just want to now really see if I can concentrate a bit on my, on, on sobriety. And I'm plodding along and, and staying sober and uh, doing what my sponsor suggested. And I... I was sponsored without huge emphasis on working. I was not told that I had to work the program. And I'm very, very grateful because inherent in all work is that era of boredom. And um, I was told, you know, there are 8 million stories in the Naked City. This is just one of them. And I was told to have a love affair with AA, to fall in love with Alcoholics Anonymous that all great relationships should start with passion. And that, because you need that passion when you're sitting across from this person seven years down the road and you're thinking, oh my God. And um, <laughs> you need that passion to remember, to revive, to think about. And I was told to have a honeymoon with AA. And, that, and you know when you fall in love with someone and you can be the busiest person on the face of the earth, but somehow you find time for that person. And, um, and finding time meant I went to meetings, meetings, meetings. I don't think I went for the, to the movies for the first two years. And I've been sober 30 years, and I've been on a diet of a meeting, two meetings a day, all my sobriety. And except if I'm on a long retreat or abroad, and I simply cannot get to a meeting. But I think of myself in that way. And... Um, and I live in New York City, so there's really no excuse you can fall out of bed into a meeting. Um, but um, I, uh, so I, I had this amazing love affair with Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I just, I love AA. And actually, it was um, up until I was about 14 years sober, I think it changed for me um, if you had asked me up until that time what was the most important thing in my life, I would have said to you, my sobriety is definitely the most important thing in my life. And it has changed now, bless you. It's changed. And from, if you were to ask me that same question today, the most important thing in my life is Alcoholics Anonymous. It, somehow it switched from me, my mind to our common welfare. And um, because I'm fickle, as I said, you know, I'm deeply shallow and I don't always have this great surge of gratitude. I don't wake up every morning thinking, oh, another opportunity to make amends and to love my fellow men. And, <laughs> but I don't. And um, that's why I need a higher power in my life to live within me, to do that for me. Um, but I've, my love of Alcoholics Anonymous has never wavered. Never. I cannot believe what I'm a part of. Anyway, um, uh, some of you already know that I was... Um, extru mm. Let me backtrack here and say that when I was 15 years sober, I went through an absolute hell. I went through the worst time I've ever known. And when I really look at it, it started about when I was 11. It started started and then I was 15 it was like the dam broke and this pain surged on me like the tsunami and I went into a really dark night and I think 
that I would like to address those people in the room that are, you know, nine years or more or going through something like this. And this is, it's the mark of a period like this is its relentlessness and its longevity. And very often people with time and sobriety will come to a mark like this and they will say, I've done a fourth step on this, I've done this, I've done that, I've worked with newcomers and nothing is relieving this pain. And then the next thought is, I'm not working a good program. I haven't done the program right. And then the next thought back from that is, I probably haven't done the program right because I'm not really an alcoholic. And the isolation starts. And when people say... You hear old Bill, he had 18 years and he went out and drank again. Can you imagine? Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I don't know how people get through their teens in sobriety, to be quite honest with you. I think, you know, if anyone's in their teens and they're having a difficult time, strap yourself in and go for the ride. And um, I was very friendly uh, with, uh, and very close with Mother Teresa. And I'd been in India many times and worked with her and worked with the poorest of the poor there. And um, anyway, to tell you this, Mother Teresa was fascinated with Alcoholics Anonymous. Absolutely fascinated. And she always wanted to talk about it. And I sometimes would tease her, you sure you don't have a problem, Mother? I mean, <laughs> you're awfully interested in this stuff. But anyway... Mother Teresa, I want to say this, you and I do not do this for ourselves alone. We do not stay sober for ourselves alone. This is not a gift given to me because God thinks, oh, you know, I'll select Lorna out from the poor woman in the Sudan that's being raped tonight or something, or uh, that she's so special. It's not given to us for ourselves alone. Anyway, um, Mother Teresa was, had success with every form of suffering human, but she could not help the alcoholic. And she could not help the alcoholic because she didn't have the words of everlasting life that you and I have. And those words are, I know how you feel. Let me tell you what happened to me. And she couldn't do that. And um, anyway, when I was going, uh, one of the, this thing I was going through lasted four years. I don't want to upset anyone here, but anyway. Um, <laughs> at one point, I thought, you know, we know what to do. You go work with others. You get out of yourself. But it was the sort of pain that I couldn't apply anything I'd known to it. None of my so-called AA wisdom worked. And the big book flew out the window. My sponsees became my sponsors. Everything I knew was turned around. And all that I uh, thought I could apply, and when I say didn't work, what I'm saying is I couldn't get out of the pain. <laughs> That's what I mean. I didn't like where I was. I wanted it to be different. I couldn't accept this torture that I was in. Anyway, um, I went off to Calcutta to work with the... Um, poor and because I thought you know that's an obvious person that's uh, worse off than me and I was telling Nancy today I started envying the lepers you know I felt that they were better off than I was anyway I came back from Calcutta and I was still in agony and um, a few months later mother came to New York and we met up and she asked me she said you know how is it going for you how are you doing and I said mother it's hell it's absolute hell. And she looked at me and she said, oh, how God must love you. She said, but he wants to be very intimate with you. And he is a jealous lover. And he is burning out of your soul everything unlike himself. And I said, well, gee, that's just swell. You know, um, <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. But... <clears throat> Anyway, um, she's right. And you and I know that if I have any kind of knowledge about my way of doing it, I'm in trouble. I need you so desperately. 
I cannot do my life my way. And I'd like to segue here into uh, uh, something I saw recently on television, and it scared the living daylights out of me. I saw this program on Nova, and it was about um, the Amazon rainforest. And they were talking about the Brazilian nut tree. And this particular tree in the Amazon is a mighty, mighty tree and it grows to a tremendous height and has a huge canopy on it and thousands of species of creatures from microscopic creatures to, you know, monkeys and squirrels and parrots and God knows what live in this Brazilian nut tree. <clears throat> well, one day a bird comes along, lands on a branch and makes a dropping on the branch. And in that warm, moist dropping is a little seed, and the seed sprouts, and the seed <clears throat> sends out a shoot, and it drops hundreds and hundreds of feet into the forest floor, and it implants itself in the forest floor, and then it grows, it sends up another shoot out of the floor, it sends out a vine, and this vine, this takes years, wraps itself around the host tree, and grows and grows and grows. And as it grows, it becomes very strong and rather like the tree itself. <clears throat> and, you know, you've seen that where there's a wrought iron fence and the tree grows up around the wrought iron fence and it's sort of embedded around the fence. Well, this vine grows around and around this mighty, mighty tree and as it grows, it crushes this tree crashes. And finally, the camera took you up hundreds of feet and you looked down this hollow, this complete hollow of this tube that the vine had formed around the tree and it had crushed the tree and there was nothing of the tree left. The tree was gone, completely gone. And I thought, oh my God, that's why I must go to meetings. I must go to meetings because I need you to say to me, Lorna, do you realize you have a little shit on your arm? <laughs> and you know, that is something that we cannot see. It's something that's so familiar to us and so ordinary and it's part of my darling personality. You know, the biggest burden to myself is my personality. This thing of, this is the way I am, this is the way I do things, and I always do... Da, 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 da. And so, I, and I can't see it. It is so embedded in me, it has become so much a part of me that I cannot see the destructive nature of something that is so ordinary to me. I cannot see this thing that I do all the time that I, so I need you. I need you to help me see that. I need to do inventories and fifth steps and work with others and, and all the stuff that we do in here. And um, so that was very frightening and it was very uh, powerful, the imagery of that out of this tiny, tiny seed that I don't take any notice of. That bottle hidden in the back of the fridge, that Whatever it is that I haven't taken notice of, that amend that I will not make, that thing that I will not share about my past, just something, and I might not even be aware of it. That's why I need to be in your company, go to meetings, to hear stories, to say, oh yes, I remember doing something like that. And, you know, just because I have time in the program and there's people here with much more time than me and it's a constant ongoing 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 adventure and um, uh, you know uh, it's getting almost time for me to end but I, I'd like to there's a whole lot of money up here it feels so good um, anyway um, the, the um, I uh, let me see, what's this? I did write something down here that I wanted to talk about. Oh, yes. I know what I wanted to say. This, there's two more stories. Sometimes, in all of us, at some point in our lives, whether it be in a major way or a minor way, are called to be a sensing rod. Are called to be the sensing rod for us 
it's Alcoholics Anonymous. But there, we can look at figures in history that have been called to be that sensing rod. I mean, the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree, and he could have gone back to the palace and lived a very fine life, but he kept sitting there, and he kept, and he broke through. He was called his enlightenment, and he understood something that millions of people have been able to follow since then. And then, you know, uh, 500 years after the Buddha was here, there was another man, and his name was Jesus, and he was in that garden the night before he was crucified, and he could have said, you know, it's a little tough. I think I'm going to nip back to Nazareth. I'm going to marry that nice girl, and um, I... I'm not going to go through with this. And we're called to be this sensing rod. And he didn't. He just kept putting one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. And I just want to say that, you know, when we're on a spiritual journey and we're called to be this sensing rod, one of the trademarks of it is it's rarely comfortable. If you're in this program, don't look for comfort. Don't look for a a life that is comfortable. Don't look for the slippers by the fire. Not going to happen. I, and then after Jesus, you know, 2,000 years after him, there was another man in Akron, Ohio, in some shabby suit one evening. His business has gone south. His name was Bill Wilson. And he stood in that lobby of that hotel. Shall I go this way or shall I go this way? And it's no great knowledge. He didn't know, oh, you know, if I go this way, Lorna Kelly will be in Alabama being able to speak. (laughs) We never know what the consequences are of that sensing rod. And he went towards the church directory instead of the bar. And, And, you know, do you honestly think that you and I would be here if Bill Wilson had had a successful day? I doubt it. If that business had gone well, I doubt Bill Wilson would have gone bothered to go to the church directory. I mean, it's like, look at me, I'm so great. Look at this business. I can finally take it home to the little woman. I'm I'm great. Into the bar. So, um, and then, you know, at one time, my calling, I get it many times, and we all do. Shall I cheat on my taxes? Shall I not be quite truthful? Shall I just hedge my bet here? After all, everyone does it. Let me make phone calls. Let me take home the office equipment. Whatever it is. And um, one time, Mother Teresa was extremely ill. And it wasn't the time she died, but it, um, I dashed over to Calcutta. We thought she was going. And um, they took me from the airport to the hospital and I'm in the hospital room with mother, and um, so it's a very narrow room. And she's in bed, propped up on her pillows. And very shortly after I got there, this young Indian priest came in to say Mass. And they set up the table at the foot of the bed as the altar, and he's standing there facing mother and saying Mass. And I'm, I mean, it's not lost on me that I'm standing here having this private Mass with you know, mother in her nighty. It, um, I, it's quite something. So anyway, he's saying mass, and then it comes time for communion. And he comes round the side of the bed, and then I'm standing here, and there's another sister standing next to me, and there's two other sisters on the other side of the bed. We're all cramped into this tiny room. And I push myself aside so that he can get to mother to give her communion. And he dips the host in the chalice of wine. And mother very reverentially sits up and takes the host on her tongue. And in that flash, I thought, oh God, not here. Don't let me have to make a fuss here. Not with this, you know, saint dying in bed next to me. Don't let me have to make a fuss about the wine. Let me just take it this one time. Lord, don't always bring all the attention onto yourself. This woman is dying in bed next to you. Just take it. It's the blood of Christ. Just take it. And, and then, as fast as that, the other thought of all the thousands that had gone before me and all the millions that had come after me. And when we're in that point, when it's like that, heaven never forces itself. Heaven holds its breath. Which way will Bill Wilson turn? Will Jesus stay in that garden? Will the Buddha sit? 
Will Mary say yes? Will Lorna take the wine? <laughs>、um, it never holds. It, it never forces itself. It just waits. And I said to that priest, "No, no, no. You know, I got this vision of all the millions, hopefully, that will come after me. And it matters what we do in the quiet and the silence and the hidden thing of our lives. It matters what we do." And、um, I said, I, "I don't want any wine, please, but I would like a dry host, please." And he's all confused. He's dipped the host by this time and holding it up to me. And anyway, I nudge the sister next to me, and she takes it. And finally, he gives me a dry host, and he goes around to offer communion to the other women on the other side of the bed. And I'm standing there, feeling very awkward, very shaken, very like I've upset mother's、uh, private mass. I've, you know, it's all about me, me, me again. And while he was on the other side of the bed, mother's hand came across the covers, and she took my hand and she leaned into me. And she pulled me down to her, and she said, "Well done. You must continue to protect your precious gift." And I want to say, you know, that you and I have an amazingly precious gift, an amazing. It is so valuable. And I was in the art world, and you know, if the Metropolitan were to call me and say, "Lorna, we have this Van Gogh, or we have this Monet that we'd like you to take care of for us." Um, would I bring it home and put it in the garage, or would I put it, hang it in the bathroom? No, I'd put it in the best place in my house, and I'd probably alter all the furnishings to suit that one precious work of art. And I'd invite my friends over to see it and to view it. And if that's just a piece of canvas or a work of art that's here today and gone tomorrow, how much more valuable is this gift of my sobriety? Amazing. Amazing, and、um, in closing, I want to say that you know I I、um, wrote a book, and it's all about me. It's absolutely <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. Um, um, but anyway.、Um, I never knew. I I wrote it and I published it myself and、uh, had it printed myself and all that sort of thing. And it's a it's, and.、Um, I、um, ordered ten thousand copies, and ten thousand copies arrived on the docks of New York, and I had no idea what I was going to do with these books. Anyway, I decided to、uh, sell them one book at a time, and I never, I never advertised it or put it in bookshops or anything, and I never knew where this book was going to end up, and and I just sold it word of mouth. I thought if it's good, it'll sell, and if it's not good, it doesn't deserve to sell. And a copy ended up on the on the、um, a death row in Texas, and I was able to. Uh, be a witness for a young man who was executed there a couple of years ago, and、uh, it's without a doubt the most、uh, evil thing I've ever witnessed in my life. But it was、um, a great privilege to be with him and to be there for him as、uh, he took his last breath, and to know there was a very fine line between me and that man strapped to that gurney, very fine line. And、um, then. Uh, it also ended up in the hands of a woman who was a hermit at, say, at Christ in the Desert Monastery in Abiquiu, New Mexico, and she started writing to me, and she invited me to visit her. And I mean, after all, how often does one get an invitation from a hermit? So.、Um, uh, I went to see her one Easter some years ago, and、uh, I had a wonderful time. And when I came home, there was a Mother Teresa had died by this time. Mother Teresa died in 97, just a few days after Princess Diana, and、um, uh, there was a letter in my mailbox after I'd visited、uh, Sister Joaquim, and it was from the Missionaries of Charity, which is Mother Teresa's order, and it was asking me if I would submit copies of my correspondence from Mother. To the tribunal investigating for her canonization, and、um, you know, it doesn't really matter what I think of that whole process. Doesn't matter. I was thrilled to death to be asked、uh, for this. So I wrote to Sister Joaquim and I said, "Can you believe they've asked me for my correspondence? I'm so delighted to be able to do this." And she wrote back and she said, "I'm praying that you get invited to be a witness for Mother Teresa's canonization." And I thought. Poor old dear, you know she's been out in the desert too long,、uh, <laughs> and the sun's gotten to her. And mother and I were close, absolutely. But that, I mean, to be a witness for a saint is 
I mean, that's in another stratosphere. It's not, I'm, that's not going to happen. But lo and behold, some months later, I came home and in my mailbox was an invitation from the tribunal inviting me to give my testimony for this um, um, servant of God, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And, um, and I did that. And do you know something? I was a... Hmm. When I, I was a small cog in a very big wheel, just a tiny cog, and it made me so happy to do it. It made me so happy to give and to be a part of that process, and it was nothing to do with me. It was nothing about my process. I mean, after all, it wasn't about my canonization, although... Um, <laughs> Maybe it was just practice. But um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, when I came into the program, I was told that life would be beyond my wildest dreams. And I thought wild dreams meant money, men, and mansions. I thought, oh, you know, wild dreams. And I now realize that when you said beyond your wildest dreams, Lorna, you meant beyond your tacky wild <laughs> dreams, Lorna. <laughs> Rocketed into the fourth dimension. And it's wild dreams and the fulfillment of wild dreams are never about the individual. They're always the blessing for all. It's not about the fulfillment just of myself. Yes, I get to benefit and feel great about it, but everyone gets to partake in that. Everyone feels, oh, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous too, and I get to be a part of supporting that. And whatever we do, you know, what blesses one blesses all. So, that to me, that uh, being the, uh, asked to do that was like, finally I understood what beyond my wildest dreams meant. And um, I could talk forever, but um, I know there's some dancing to be done. And I want to thank you so much for going to meetings, for doing service, for being my friend for making arrangements for me to get here, for all the things that you do, for putting money in the basket. Never, ever, ever let the basket pass without contributing. If you don't have any money, throw your watch in. Cut a, <laughs> cut, cut a lock off your hair. Write a poem. Do something. Contribute in some way to the basket. And because it's an indication of how we feel about life. And um, I want to thank you so much for all that you do, for getting the alcohol out of your house, for doing the literature, for running people around, and whatever it is that you do. Because if you weren't here, I'd have nowhere to go. And my life would just have been a continuation of the steps of the Metropolitan Museum. So thank you for your sobriety. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.